It's like the one night permafrost thaw, climate change, and carbon emissions. Just want to take a moment to thank uh, the Geshki series season ticket holders, who some of them are with us tonight, and to some of the Weekend at the Library sponsors as well. Thank you. It is through your generous support that we can not only bring you exciting summer programming such as, as this, but continue to serve our island community year round. And our hardworking adult programming staff, Sammy and Sean are also on hand to help tonight. If you need anything, if you would like an assisted hearing device, please let us know and we can help you with that. And without further ado, moderating tonight's lecture is Kitty Pilgrim, a journalist, author, and it turns out an Arctic traveler. After a 30 year global career at CNN, she started a world journey that led her to remote regions of the planet. She is now a director of the Explorers Club and spends her professional life in the world of foreign policy, working on issues related to international security. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Kitty to introduce Dr. Natalie. So thank you. And I'm intimidated to actually do this interview. She is so brilliant, which we will see in just a moment. Um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about the Arctic and she spends a lot of time actually walking the walk. So I'm just talking the talk and she's walking the walk. And so Sue, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I just wanted to start with the science. We're going to start with just the basic science of what you do. And then we'll go from there. But I think it's really important to set a foundation. You basically work with permafrost and you check greenhouse gases. And one of the things that you said is, it's like measuring the earth's breath. And I thought, oh, that's very poetic. That's very <laughs> poetic. Tell us what you mean by that. Tell us what you do and, and explain why permafrost is part of measuring the earth's breath. Yeah, so should I, I guess I don't know if everybody knows what permafrost is. Everyone I know knows what permafrost is. So let me just start with that. Permafrost is permanently frozen ground. Um, as simple as that. Anything in the ground that does not thaw, that never thaws, it's the, the soil, um, partly decomposed mammoth, that's all permafrost, the rock. And um, a lot of that permafrost is essentially ancient partly decomposed plants. And so the, the breath part of it comes in is that plants take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So they're breathing in that carbon dioxide. They drop their leaves. Um, those leaves will, you know, just like you have a compost pile kind of it turns to soil, the same thing happens. Um, except in the Arctic over thousands and tens of thousands of years because it's cold, because it's wet, the, the the organic matter in the ground, it never gets broken up, it just gets frozen. And slowly, 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 this has been building up. So there's this really, really big pool of frozen organic matter. Um, that organic matter becomes food for microbes. Um, so the microbes eat it, they get energy, and they breathe out carbon dioxide and methane. And so a lot of the work that I do is just carbon dioxide taken up from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide and methane that's being released. Um, and this is, a, this is a natural system that happens um, across the planet, this like uptake and release. Um, in, in, in the Arctic, we have this situation where you have this ancient, ancient storage that's been frozen and now it's slowly, slowly thawing and we're kind of changing the balance of things quite a bit. So. One of the things that I read in, in uh, looking at your work was that different things decompose at different rates. And so that complicates your work. Yeah, I, I always, I like to think about it. Um, so it, it, carbon is such a, it, it's just like, a lot of people don't think it's a concrete thing, but it is a really concrete thing. A tree, half of a tree is carbon. 
a banana, half of a banana is carbon, right? And so if I gave you a banana and I gave you a branch, you'd eat the banana before you would eat the branch. You'd probably never want to eat the branch. And it's the same thing for microbes, right? The, there's different, we call it lability. There's different labilities of the carbon. It's in different forms. I mean, carbon's an element, but it's in, when it's a molecule, it's in different forms. And microbes have an easier time breaking down some forms and get energy more easily in some forms. And so this is a big complication for us in saying, okay, this, this, all this food, all this organic matter is going to thaw. It's not going to immediately burst into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases, but there are these natural processes of microbes that break it down. How fast will they break it down? And that is different in many, many different places. Like we talk about the Arctic, but it's many, many, many different places. There's forest, there's tundra. The, the ground could be sandy. It could be really peaty. Like, so this is a major challenge of the work that I do. Many, many other scientists are working on trying to figure this out. So it's uh, very hard to project how fast it's going to happen. How, that's the science part. That's, that's where your science. brilliance really shines through because you're trying to measure this. Tell us how you, how you measure it and how you can, tell us how it okay. works. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Um, so there's a couple of things you could do. I mean, if you wanna know, first question is like, how much carbon is in the permafrost? You drill a hole in the ground, you take, you know, you have to drill with motor, but we drill down, you pull it out and you can measure the carbon. But then you wanna say, oh, how fast will that carbon be released as greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane? You could take that, you can put it in a jar and you can measure the greenhouse gases. The other, so that is one way. Um, the other thing we do is we set up equipment um, that is on, on towers that are sitting you know, out in the tundra or they're up on scaffolding, raised up high above a forest and they're called eddy covariance towers. And this eddy covariance instrumentation measures the earth's breath. It measures CO2, methane and water that's moving through the, through the canopy, through the forest into the air and being taken back up again. And so this is something, you know, we set this up and we do this in individual points. The Arctic is a very large place and we can't get everywhere. And so we combine this on the ground measurements with satellite data. Um, and we use this, we put these two pieces of information together to try to say like, what do we know about the current, what we say carbon balance, the current movement of greenhouse gases in the Arctic. Um, we then also will take a next step where we take this information and we um, let it communicate with the model. And the models, we're using the model to say, to try to understand the processes which we put in the model. And then we use this to say, what's gonna happen in the future? Mm -hmm. How, so the towers I understand, um, and I'm not a science person, so bear with me. The towers I understand, but how do, what do you get off the satellite? How do, how do you? So, so right now, there are some satellites that can detect methane like in, in, in the column. Um, in the Arctic, um, those those satellites need light, so you don't you can't get any measurements much uh, half much of the year is dark in the Arctic, so they're not useful there. But they're also right now used for more point sources, so they can detect methane in a in a gas in a gas pipeline leak. So we really don't have the capability right now with our satellites to measure methane and and CO two that's naturally coming out of these ecosystems. So we, we do with the satellites is we can detect different um, different ecosystem types. So a forest, a, a desert tundra, a wetland tundra, and then we have measurements in a forest in a wetland tundra, and we we say we we upscale them. So you, we use statistical models to say, okay, we have some measurements in these types of systems. We know the relationship between whatever methane and temperature in this desert tundra. And then we use that and we extrapolate it. So we're using the satellite data really as a tool to extrapolate a point measurement to a much larger area. You know, you say you drill down and I've seen video of this <laughs> drill and it's, it's pretty impressive. I mean, yeah. it is not just gardening that we're doing here. No, this is a monster <laughs> machine and, and you're extremely petite. How do, <laughs> how do you deal with this? And then she pulls out a plug about this, big and deals with that 
I, I mean, I'm absolutely destroyed after a half an hour of gardening. I don't know how she can do <laughs> because it, and with the conditions, yeah. you know, where you're sinking it into vegetation with boots on and it's spongy and it looks difficult. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like my favorite thing. And I actually haven't drilled. I'm going to be drilling in in a week. I'm going. I'm going up to Alaska, and it is it is one of my favorite things to do because every time you pull, so you, so you drill on this, um, but you pull this core out of the ground, and it's it's like you. I feel like each one is a gift. I know this sounds like you can see the history of this of this place, and you see. You know, you'll get a, a layer like this that's just like all ice, and it's just like beautiful crystal ice. Or sometimes you get a whole core that's ice. Or sometimes you can go down, and all of a sudden you're down a meter, and you're in tundra, and you're like, get this big branch. You're like, oh my gosh, like what happened in this place? So it's, I mean, it's scientifically, it's like it, you, this is like you get so much information from it, but there's also something very like beautiful and aesthetic about it, at least to me. That I love. Yeah, I love. It's one of my favorite things to do. It sounds amazing. <laughs> I'm going to just go into the science a little bit more. Um, we have in the Arctic, it's, a, it's, a, it's not one country. There's not one country that's responsible for um, the greenhouse gases that are coming out of the Arctic, but it's all of our, it's all of our responsibility and problem. Now. Yeah. So in the global context, what are we looking at in terms of how dangerous is this? And I you know, I'm a journalist, I'm gonna use the most incendiary word I possibly can. How dangerous is this to the planet? And, and, and how concerned are you that we're not doing enough right now? Put it, put it in context for us, because we're all sitting here perfectly comfortable, but TikTok, it's, it's, coming, it's coming up on us. Yeah. Um, so, when permafrost thaws, it is not a burst of greenhouse gases that come out. So that's, you know, in some ways that's the good news, but at the same time, I think it allows us to be complacent because it's a thing that's happening in the future. But it is something that we are committing ourselves to. So um, estimates of greenhouse gas emissions from thawing permafrost, say by the end of this century, may be larger than emissions from the United States at our current rate, cumulative emissions. And so we're, it, maybe they'll be the size of Japan. Like there is some scientific uncertainty, but what we do know is that these emissions will be on par with major greenhouse gas emitting nations. Um, and the big problem is that we, you know, we want to stay below 1.5 C or two degrees Celsius. And there's lots of um, all the countries internationally, there's a Paris agreement, we're tracking emissions to try to stay below 1.5 or two C. So we have this, what's called a, re, a carbon budget, right? So the carbon budget is the amount of carbon we have less left that we can emit carbon dioxide and methane. Um, and so the big issue with permafrost is it isn't a country. Nobody's responsible for it, um, but the emissions will be on par with some major countries. And then the big issue is that it, it's not going into our bookkeeping. So our bookkeeping is wrong. And so if we want to stay below to see, we, you know, our action, it's like, it's an amplifier, right? Like we have to act faster. We have to act more. Um, the, the plus side of that is as we reduce emissions elsewhere, we then get less emissions from permafrost. So it's like a good news, bad news, good news story, I think, based on how we, how we act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I read in your work is that, um, say, a sinkhole. So the it it melts. I'm doing this in really layman's. So just straighten me out <laughs> if I'm doing this wrong. We do that if it we if if it thaws, <laughs> um, got it. Um, it sinks, and then there's more surface area, so that it can thaw some more. Yeah, and yeah. so it can accelerate, right? Yes. Yeah. So one issue with the, the way our projection, so many, many models don't even include permafrost in it. So models that inform international policy, so reports that inform some of this, the IPCC reports, um, many of them, most of them don't even include permafrost, so they weren't built into the models. And the ones that do assume this process 
or or depict the process of permafrost thaws gradually. Heat comes in, it heats the ground, it heats the permafrost, it thaws. But this is this other process. People it's called either a thermal karst or abrupt thaw. That because there's ice in the permafrost, when that ice the ice in the permafrost melts, the permafrost thaws. So when the ice melts, you do get this ground collapse, and that collapsing ground now allows um, heat to come in this way, come in this way, and it makes things accelerate, and that actually may double the permafrost carbon feedback. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to get these very, um, these disturbances, these abrupt disturbances into the model so that we can get better estimates of permafrost thaw. And there's many reasons why collapsing ground is a problem, but in terms of carbon emissions, it can speed things up. And then the other thing that can happen is it can change um, the, the environment. So you may have a dry place that then sinks and may become a wetland or a lake. You may have a lake that has permafrost underneath it and then permafrost thaws and it allows drainage and it may dry. So there's a lot of a lot of complications when we're trying to figure out what will happen in the future in the Arctic. One of the images that made a lot of sense to me um, in a visual way is that if you have a lake and you get uh, a crack because of this thawing of the permafrost, all the water can drain like yeah. out of a bathtub and just just decimate this lake. And literally can happen over like overnight. Like people, there are reports. I mean, I, I've seen it happen. I went to a lake one year, the next year it was gone, but reports from folks on the ground is like it literally like happening overnight that you have this drainage and drainage down where you have this crack or drainage through the side. Um, yeah. Do you have, oh my gosh, moments like that when you see things like that? It's very dramatic, it seems. I mean, it seems like if a lake just drains overnight. It must affect the population. It must affect the people who live in the area. Yeah, it there's has... lots of, yeah, there's lots. I mean, it's it is like for people living, there's, you know, there's the carbon story of it, but then there's like access to fresh water, access to food, um, just, I mean, even, even for us sitting here, most people are not subsistence, I'm assuming, or you're going buying your food at the supermarket, not hunting and fishing. So even if you're not relying on the land for your food, like you, we, we identify with the land, with our environment. So there's, there, yeah, there is something like, and for me, yes, I'm going up there and then I'm coming back to my home here on the Cape, but it is, it is startling and it's, and it's shocking when you see these things happening so rapidly and you go to a place and you're like oh my gosh I was just here last year and sometimes it's lakes sometimes it's ground that's sinking you know some places I know really well I can just I was like oh my gosh wow we like measured this last year and now it's gone because it's in that lake I know I had a sensor here and it's not here anymore and you know sometimes animals take it but I'm like no my GPS point is actually in water now wow yeah yeah, no, you have the year-to-year -year comparisons um, that are yeah. shocking. I um, I remember this image from, um, uh, I think it was a CBS piece, where a road just looked like a piece yeah. of ribbon candy because it had, I mean, that has to just, that has to be very annoying for the people who live there. <laughs> yeah. To have the road just do that. Yeah, roads kind of, yeah, like a roller coaster ride like this and Yes, it is definitely, um, it's definitely, it's, it's startling, um, yeah. Let's, let's go to the human side of it. We've, we've done a lot of the science and I would love to get some questions from you if you have scientific questions and hopefully your vocabulary will be more precise than mine. But let's go to the human side of it. And you work a lot with the indigenous people in the area. Um, you're, you're, you know, a, a scientific brain and, and, but you also have a heart and you, see what's happening in this environment. Tell us a little bit about the people who are living on this land and how they're coping with these changes. Um, yes, I mean, the, when I, so I work, I work, I work throughout the Arctic, but for the work that I do um, with communities that are living on permafrost and are making decisions about adaptation, most of that work is in Alaska. And I will say, I have a science Brain, but I have a Western science PhD trained brain, which has 
trained me to be slightly like narrow in my thinking. So we as scientists get very, very, very detailed about a certain thing. And thank and, goodness you do. Yeah, like yeah. this is very valuable. <laughs> um, but the world functions is very multifaceted, right? And climate change impacts. So I actually, I get a lot of knowledge, understanding, um, my, the way that I think about the system, that is, it is a partnership between me and my tribal partners because the indigenous knowledge, indigenous ways of knowing, like they are, they've been living on the land. And so, you know, when I say permafrost, they're like, well, it's permafrost and flooding and it's erosion and it's changes in our food and it's changing the weather. And I'm like, okay, I, I, I get this. And so that's actually been really valuable for me to, to better understand the system. Um, I sorry, I forgot what the question was. What what do I yeah? So so I'll just pick up from yeah. You know, you're getting your year over year science, yeah. and they're getting their year over year. How do we make a living? How do yeah. We okay. Yeah. So just explain to me about how they're living on this land because for us we go to Stop and Shop and done deal. How yeah. are they living on this land? Yeah. How much are they dependent on this? A lot. And like, so a lot of the communities I work with, they're, they're not on the road system. So you either access them by river in the summertime. You can, in the winter, you can, you know, take a snow machine or you can drive on the river um, or you fly in. And they're smallish communities and there are many of them. Um, if there's a market in the village, it's um, extremely expensive, you know. 15 plus dollars for, you know, for, for milk or something like that. So most people are not like, it's just not as sustainable. So people are getting their food from, you know, collecting berries and hunting and fishing throughout the year. And that's a major part of what we, they do. And, you know, when I'm working with them, it's like, no, you can't come in July. That's fishing season. Can't come in September. So we, we are the field, like that is the priority. That is a way of living, a way of life and a, a way of their culture. So um, that's really important part. That's being impacted in many ways by climate change, by permafrost thaw and other changes. So, um, for example, when permafrost thaws, um, there's, it, you know, you're, you're putting like silt, you're getting the, the water kind of silty. Salmon may, may not like that silty water. So in some places, salmon aren't, aren't going to the places where people had normally fished for salmon. Um, but at the same time, there's also just changes because the temperature is warmer, um, moose are changing their behavior. And so seasonality is changing for when people are allowed to hunt and when when the animals are around. So the animals are also changing their behavior. You, you know, you're also getting the ground collapse that we talked about. So places where people used to go collect berries are now wetlands. And this has been fascinating with me because I'll go up in a community and there'll be someone who's like, yeah, like not that old. And they're like, oh yeah, we used to go berry picking there when I was a kid. And I'm like, wow, I know berries where they need to grow. They need to grow on like, everything's kind of wet up in the Arctic, but like higher ground. And I see a wetland and I'm like, where do you go berry picking now? And they're like, oh, we, we can't, you know? And so yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, there, there's, there's a lot that is happening at one time. On top of that, you have the ground collapse that's affecting um, infrastructure, you know, infrastructure, same thing. You have erosion that's tied into this. You have loss of, loss of sea ice. So sea ice is really important. People rely on it to go out for, for hunting. It's also, I, you know, I think of it similar to sand dunes, how sand dunes protect from storms. This land fast sea ice, the sea ice along the land, you know, it used to be along the Arctic coastline, sorry, in the Alaska coastline um, in the fall, and now it's not there. So storms that are happening that have always happened are having a much bigger impact on land. So there's just so many things that are happening at once. And um, I sometimes feel overwhelmed. Like when I go there and people are just telling me these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, how are you dealing with this? And people are dealing with it, right? I mean, we, you deal with what you have to deal with. This is what we do as humans. Um, and we're just trying to, you know, me as a scientist, like what is the technical support I can provide to make your, the decision-making that people are having to make? Do we move our homes? Do we move our village? You know, you know, can we stay here? How long can we stay here? How do I, how can I provide that technical support that that's needed? So, so you've had actual villages that have to move. Yeah, people. yeah. 
Yeah, so. Oh, the thing you just said about the moose, they shoot moose and they use that for food. People hunt moose, people hunt seal, people hunt caribou, people, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I'll start My New stuff. Yorker is coming out here. I was just like, wow, that, that must be a really amazing way to live. You work with, um, with a lot of the youth in the area. So you've kind of got your own posse going that help you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, the youth, the, the indigenous youth or the yeah. Paris? What are we talking about? The, the indigenous youth. Yeah, I mean, I actually like, yeah, I haven't, I mean, we, yeah, we, we, we actually don't have a, we're working with everyone in the community. So when I go into communities in Alaska, like I work with the tribe and the tribe is making the decisions on what we do and who we work with in the tribe. I have recently had a really great um, opportunity to work, or my team has had a great opportunity to work with youth in uh, Nunavut and Pond Inlet um, and amazing, amazing um, organization where the youth are acting or are consultants to us as scientists to help us to communicate the research that we do and to help make our research relevant to the community. So it's been very interesting because you know my prior experience is working with college students, youth of different, where I'm the mentor and they are mentoring us in this scenario and they are assessing our work. And so this is actually a relatively new relationship, but it's been really valuable for us. Um, they are very, you know, they're they're very wise and they're also free and it's a really nice exchange like they're free with their ideas with us and so they've been they've been really helping and guiding us in the work that we do and how we communicate it because like you go in to talk to someone you say I'm going to measure greenhouse gases people are like why why do I care right and so getting at that point where we're figuring out like where are our shared values which I think there are a lot but how do we communicate those shared values so we are working together on this project is I think a really, it's hard for scientists, right? Like it's not part of the scientific training, but um, they've been really, really helpful for it's us in that. Very much the human side of science. It's, it's the application, yeah. right? And it is, a, yeah. How did you get into this? Because it's not a normal career path to just say, I'm going to go up and freeze and dig holes <laughs> and walk through swampy ground and um, try really hard against this huge problem that's a global, I mean, the enormity of what you're doing strikes me because many of us are not as um, ambitious and feel that we can have the power to do what you're doing. And But what you do, when people say, oh, I wanna grow up and make a difference, you are making a difference. How did you arrive at this, this moment of power? And I'm, I'm extraordinarily impressed. A, a woman taking on the world, telling everybody greenhouse gases, get your act together. It's just wonderful <laughs> to see. <laughs> I had thought about it that way. Okay, how did I get here? So I, um, many, 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 many years ago, I will say when I graduated college, I had this mentality of, do I, I love science. Do I want to be a scientist or do I want to have an impact on the world? And my brain then was that these were two separate pathways. And so I thought, oh, if I want to have an impact, I'm going to work for, you know, an NGO and, you know, some nonprofit and, or I'm going to go into policy. Um, and so I, I kind of struggled a bit and wandered around. I eventually was like, I love science. I have to become a scientist. And so that's where I head. And I, I started working in the Arctic because... I was very interested in carbon cycling and impacts of ecosystems on the planet. And I was like, what are places that are really important for carbon cycling? What are places that are changing the fastest? And I was like, it's the Arctic. I need to go there. And I also at the same, or a little time after that, I started working at Woodwell Climate Research Center. And I came to this place where I was like, oh, like you actually can do science and have an impact. These are not two separate career traje trajectories, right? And so, you know, I was like, okay, this is this research that I can do where I can do what I love. I like I like to be outside. Apparently didn't know I like to drill holes in the ground, but I, I really like to drill holes in the ground. Um, and, and I can do this in a way where I can have this opportunity to have this science inform decision-making. And so, you know, I just, 
it just was you know, a lot of things came together at the right time for me. And I, and I do think it's, it, it is always really important to like follow your heart, right? Like my heart was like, I like doing something. Like I, you have to do the thing that you, you can, you can, everybody can have an impact in a different career path. So you have to do the thing that like where your heart is, but it was really amazing opportunity to be able to do this at Woodwell Climate Research Center. And then this project that I'm working on from Across Pathways, where I now have this opportunity to like work with tribes, to work with policymakers, to bring these teams together in a way that hopefully will have impact. You know, we started sort of with a poetic note saying, you know, you're measuring the breadth of the earth. And I, I want to end up, uh, our conversation and then open it up to everyone else on a bit of a poetic note. I mean, I adore the Arctic um, and people say, what, you know, you how, how, why do you love the Arctic? You love the Arctic at, at, at really organic level. You love the Arctic. Tell me why it speaks to you. So the first place where I worked in the Arctic was um, outside Denali National Park. And I was setting up a climate change experiment. And every day I went to work, I lived in a cabin with a bunch of sled dogs outside. It was a dry cabin, meaning there's no water. Um, and every day I went to work and when the clouds weren't there, I could see Denali, the mountain, the mountain. And I was just outside in this place that was really beautiful. And I I had this opportunity to really connect with the land, with the space, with the environment, where it was like every day, every single day for this period, I was going there and I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I have to go to work. Like I I, I love this. And I, and you know, you know intimately, like every plant, like I, it was like it became my a place that I I became a part of. And when I left the, that, you know, when I came back, you know, when I left the field for the season. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm, that my a part of me is there and a part of that place is with me. Um, and at that point, my connection was really with, with place, with the environment. I didn't have at the time connection with Ar Arctic residents as much. Um, that has since built. And when I started meeting and working people in the Arctic, I think it just like, it just continued to build and to build and like the the respect and the understanding and the knowledge that people have of that land. And that little piece, like for me, when I had that that summer where I really connected, like for the folks there, it's like that times, times a thousand. And so this is opportunity to be in a place where there's this very, very natural connection with space, with place. It wasn't really anything like I've gone camping, but it was nothing to that level. And so I hadn't ever really experienced that before, and it definitely changes the way that I see the the planet, our role as humans on the planet, and um, motivates me to do this work that can be very, very hard at times. You must feel very small in this vastness. That's what I find about the Arctic, that I suddenly feel like a speck because it's so big. Yeah, we are specks. <laughs> I think I'm usually pretty important. I am a speck. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Uh, let's, yeah. let's open it up. Um, person in the back. Okay, why don't you take the mic so we can hear you? Could you describe the Arctic? Like, how big is it? Like, we hear it talked about all the time, like this amorphous thing, like, is yeah. it the size of South America? Like, what is the landmass of the Arctic, and this permafrost a, area? It's a good question. And like, the other question is like, what is the Arctic? Because actually people define it differently. Traditionally, it's like the area above the Arctic Circle. My definition of the Arctic is the area that's underlain by permafrost or impacted by permafrost. A colleague uh, who is a, um, studies rivers, um, their interpretation is the watersheds that the Arctic rivers feed into. So there's a lot of different definitions of the Arctic and it's not one thing. Um, I do think the permafrost impacted area is probably the best definition of the Arctic. <laughs> but, um, so it, there's ar some Arctic is tundra. There's actually a lot of forests. So the boreal forests in, in Canada, there's lots of boreal forests in, in Alaska that have permafrost underneath them. And Russia is very different. It's a large forest there and in in very, very different species. So um, a quarter of the Northern hemisphere land area is 
considered um, the permafrost region. So it so it's a it's a very very large and diverse place, um, and you know it's it functions. The reason I define it as the permafrost region is because functionally, what makes the Arctic really unique is that you have this ice water dynamic, which we don't have here, right? You have climate change here and there's fires similar as there are, are in the North, but you don't have this dynamic where you're going from one phase to the next and that can make a huge difference like in the land, the land can collapse. Or if we're talking about, you know, ice on, yeah, there, there's many different. So I feel like this like ice, ice and permafrost dynamic is really to me what defines the Arctic. I'm sorry, it's hard to see. I'd like to know about the policy implications of the research you're doing and what you'd like to see our elected officials do with your research. Um, so a couple of things. So on the adaptation front, I would like to see a climate change um, adaptation re or relocation governance framework in the United States. Right now, the United States, and I don't know if any country, has a, a governance framework, a plan who makes decisions if a community needs to relocate? What are the criteria for that? Like right now, it's it's I don't know who I don't know nobody knows who makes these decisions. So we need a plan because this isn't just going to be an Arctic problem. This is going to be many 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 places on the coast are going to be dealing with this. And so I think the Arctic are leaders in this and driving this. So first of all, we need an adaptation relocation slash governance framework. I think in terms of mitigation, I think that there needs to be um, in accounting for emissions from unmanaged lands, including permafrost. So first, we just need to measure it and count it. I think there needs to be um, more support for science for some of the modeling because the models aren't up to speed and it's not because the scientists don't know how to do it. There's just not enough support there. Um, I think we need to greatly accelerate and provide support for people to be making climate smart decisions. So vastly, vastly, much faster, reduce our fossil fuel emissions. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. The other, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this uh, lovely evening and all the information. So with permafrost uh, around the globe releasing um, all these gases into the atmosphere and the planet just generally warming, is there any benefit to the longer growing season of the trees and the plants that now are actually maybe, you know, releasing oxygen for a month or two longer? Is there any offset to the decline of permafrost with the growth of um, forests and other plant life? Yeah, it's a really good question. So plants are growing bigger in northern regions and trees can, are, are moving up, shrubs are getting quite a bit larger. Um, and that's happening because you're having an extended growing season. I mean, it's not gonna extend forever because it's dark, but it, it is extended. And also when permafrost thaws, in, the, in addition, microbes, they break down the organic matter, they release greenhouse gases, but they're also releasing nutrients. So there's like this fertilization effect that's happening. Um, in places, there's 10 to 100 times more carbon below ground than is stored in plants. And so what we do see, and we know this from experiments, we know this from observations, when the permafrost thaws, the initial thing you see is that there is a pulse of net uptake, but then the ground and the microbes, they overtake that. So it's this balance and it seems like the plants aren't winning. And to, the reason we put these towers up and, and that we don't just collect a permafrost core is we do wanna know what is the whole system response. And what we have been seeing is that systems, you know, the Arctic has been a, what we say, a carbon sink. So there's a net greenhouse gases going in. So even though plants are taking it up, microbes are giving it off. It's been a net in, that's why there's so much carbon there. So even though it's been a net carbon sink for thousands and tens of thousands of years, sites where we have long-term monitoring, they're starting to shift. And even though the plants are getting bigger, there's more There's more going out. Not everywhere, but it, 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 we're, we're starting to see that, which is, which is new. Could I follow up on that botanical question? Because it occurred to me that um, as you're getting um, wetter lands, you could maybe put in a crop to keep the, because the, the plants create a barrier that's like insulates the frozen part of the permafrost. Is there a way to 
do some kind of species that you could plant to keep it the ground more frozen? Yeah, so like one of the things that's really hard about direct interventions is just that it's a huge place and it's so hard to get to, right? And so there have been people who proposed, oh, we can put down um, like black carbon or ash or whatever, and that maybe will like bind the carbon in there. But in order to do that and to get out to all of these places in the Arctic, you're going to use more energy. And it's really, it's just, it's, it's just not, it just isn't. Fortunately, is like it's cheaper to reduce fossil fuel emissions globally than to do direct or easier than it is to do direct yeah. interventions. Let's so. do it smart. <laughs> <laughs> and also there's many other benefits for reducing fossil fuel emissions globally and protecting forests. So where else? I sir. Oh, I got hands. I cannot see. So the yeah. mic people with mics should I think take charge. Hand. Sure. Um, so my question is relating to um, kind of the economic and geopolitical considerations. So the Arctic seems <laughs> to have this issue, even if we just left it alone, yet the United States and Russia and many other countries are starting to compete from a security standpoint in this region. And you, you mentioned as we, for example, take mitigation steps, that can actually complicate things and make them worse. I I'm wondering what the economic and security activity in the region does to further uh, make more powerful these feedback loops that you described earlier? So let me make sure I understand the question. So how is economic activity and increased activity in the Arctic because of geopolitical and security regions impacting uh, greenhouse gas emissions and permafrost costs? Is that right? Um, so there's definitely more activity happening in northern regions. Um, I think there's, and there is a direct impact of things like if you're going to be building pipelines, if you're going to be building. At the same time, um, there are, like permafrost thaw is impacting U.S say military bases in the Arctic because it's it's hard to do military operations when you're getting sinking down and people can't can't move around. And so I don't know that sort of the these direct impacts, I don't, I actually don't know like what is the proportion of their impact on permafrost thaw versus climate. Um, just one thing on the economic though, and I'm gonna it's a, the other direction is there also is a huge economic impact of permafrost thaw and an impact on like potential like military and security activity because like think about all the pipelines that are you know on permafrost and all the costs of maintaining those pipelines and and railroads and so not nothing to say people's homes you know people's fish camps people's livelihoods like all of that like cultural but like it's in the hundred the estimates are in the hundreds of billions of dollars of costs. And you know, under our current trajectory, about half of the infrastructure in the Arctic is at risk as a result of permafrost thaw. So it's um, it's definitely like people often talk about the cost of say relocating a community, but actually the cost of doing nothing is so much, so much more. So I think I I think I didn't really answer your question, but. <laughs> That, yeah. that is the most amazing point. And I'd like to put you in front of Congress and just have you say that one thing, the cost of doing nothing is- <laughs> It's really is, expensive, yeah. Yeah. It's not smart. Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if you can help me understand is, is the perma, permafrost is thawing, being frozen. What was it like, you know, way back when before it was frozen? I don't know. Um, yeah, so there was many, 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 many years ago, um, many, many, many years ago, it was not frozen. Um, the issue with it now is like the, so yes, it was a very different system and there was like vegetation that you, you would not see now in the Arctic. But so yes, there was a time when you didn't have this frozen state that we have. The issue with it now is that it's like fossil fuels, right? Like it's like this ancient carbon 
that's in the ground that's not part of our like current system so it's essentially like on a human time frame this extra gigantic pool of carbon that can go into the atmosphere and then we also have this accelerated rate and so just that's you know i think that's like for many many places on the planet right like because it's happening so quickly there's just not the time for the systems to respond and from human perspectives we will yes i think the earth will earth will survive right but it's it is we're we're buying ourselves into a lot of like human suffering and impact so yeah i, I believe all that but i was just curious you know there were there were bigger bigger vegetation was it where there was bigger vegetation and there was yeah and there was like and there was uh wildlife that you associate with temperate climates that were that you find fossilized bones in the arctic well, what happened to it to well there glaciation you know there was there was like you know cycles of warming and cooling on the planet and do you ever find anything that's sort of interesting from another era there's a place that i work in that i used to work in siberia and um there are these eroding cliffs it's called the Vani Yar. it's amazing amazing place and they're like collapsing and there's like gigantic ice wedges in it and as the cliffs are collapsing like you walk along this like very mucky shoreline and you pick up something that looks like driftwood and it could be like a mammoth bone and, and this is like and like not just one or two like all along like you're like bones and bones and bones we found a pleistocene age I, th I think it was like a wolf or something i'm not a yeah like there's a credible yeah it was really really incredible mammoth tusks yeah what do you, you call someone and say come pick this up no like we like to, you have to leave it there I like but we do we you know i've been there with science we collect it and then we leave it there and then we move it's on astonishing. i mean really yeah. Kind of amazing. yeah it is amazing it is amazing it sounds yeah. like jurassic park <laughs> <laughs> but people they found seeds that they've grown like the tens of thousands of year old seeds and in, in the same area in the coloma region of siberia that that have uh, regenerated and recently they i think they found a some type of worm that's still alive this is a recent study i saw so it's a little bit beyond the research that i do i kind of stick with carbon but um, yeah, so there's some pretty fascinating things that scientists and local people have been finding and thawing permafrost. I'm sensing a movie plot here. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, I understand that since the Ukraine war started, there's not the cooperation with Russian scientists, which I understand was very valuable. What effect has that had on your research? yeah um so russian scientists as i understand it from my colleagues are not allowed to share data outside of russia so that's there's been a gap there and very 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 challenging to get equipment in so as monitoring equipment that does exist breaks it's kind of just it's it's a gap so i still i have russian colleagues that i've worked with for a long time and we still talk and we still have conversations but um there definitely has been a gap and a large part of the work that i am doing now is to expand this monitoring network across the arctic and so we had plans for installing towers because one of the one of the the areas where there is the most permafrost is in russia the areas where there are the most monitoring gaps is in siberia is in russia and so we had plans to do a lot of installations there and um those are not happening right now so um we can do some work remotely but it is it essentially creates continued uncertainty and i and i think it's kind of a shame i personally feel like science is a place where we should be able to have allow cooperation among scientists and that there there's barriers for that happening right now not from the science you know scientists not by choice of the scientists so I'm a scientist and I'm always thinking about the impact of the science that we conduct. And so I'm sort of curious when you started talking about cracks and sinkholes and how small cracks can lead to major changes in permafrost over a period of time that might be relatively fast. I just wondered when you're doing core samples, whether you worry about the impact of your science on 
the thing that you're studying. Yeah, I worry about that a lot. And so when I take a permafrost, first of all, I do try to be very, like, I'm like, I only take what I need is number one, you know, like just because you can co get a permit for hundred samples, like I'm like, what is the minimal amount that we need? Um, when I'm gonna take a permafrost core, I'll like cut out a block of the vegetation and you can actually kind of lift it up in one piece and move it. I take then all the thawed soil out and I take it out in order. I put it down on a tarp and then I drill this hole in the ground. And when I'm done, I put everything back up. So there is this hole, but it's kind of getting filled in with, with water and then put the vegetation back on. And remarkably, I've gone back to places and like I actually can't find the hole that I drilled. And so the vegetation does seem to do a good job if you go down quite far. You lift it up by the roots and you take it out. But I, I do try to be very respectful and careful in the science that I do. And there is always, you know, there's always an impact of humans and humans walking and the best we can do is just really say like, is this necessary? What is the reason that I'm doing this? Like who who wants this research to happen and what's the benefit of it? And then, and just try to do it as respectfully as possible. Hi. Hi. I'm hoping you can speak to uh, the Google grant that your team got recently, um, but a question I have in regards to the indigenous population, I feel like you're uh, in a position to speak for them or at least convey some of their experiences. I think the indigenous experience, especially on the front lines, is really vital. And I'm wondering if you have a, a take on how to convey that experience to um, people here and people that are living in the States that don't have that intimate connection to uh, the activity that you're witnessing. Um, I wonder if you have a, a take on that or a way that we can all kind of capture that experience besides documentary. Yeah, I mean, I would love to have my indigenous partners here and, um, and maybe we can do that next year to convey this because um, I can only convey my interpretation of what I see as a person from, you know, East Coast and and, and what they tell me. Um, so I'm mean, yeah, and I can and I can go back to the I can go back to the Google grant if you want, but I guess I would say in terms of um, my indigenous partners and their perspective, I I mean for me it's yeah, like it's, I, I can't speak for people. I can ex I can speak my experiences that um, really smart, connected people who understand um, the system very holistically and who have been living in a way that has protected that system for a really long time and are being impacted by activities that have happened elsewhere on the planet, but also at the same time are responding to that and are, you know, I mean, Sometimes I hate the word resilience because like when you're resilient, you don't really have a choice, you know, but they are like people are like humans are resilient. And so they're really showing a lot of leadership, not not by choice, you know, they have to in how they respond to many, many multiple climate change and hazards and policy challenges and colonization, like all of these things. And so um I, I, yeah, I guess I feel like their experience is just like, it's like the main, the word that I think of is respect, like they, ha their respect for their land, their respect for their community, the, it's, it's a really, it's a really, yeah, I, I I'm not exactly sure, like how to answer this, but I do think we have um, a lot to learn, and it's really important to have these um, Indigenous knowledge holders in the room um, for us to learn from them and to hear their voices. Um, and then do you want me to comment on the Google grant or do you, you had mentioned it? Yeah, so I mean, this work is funded from two places, from Ted Audacious, which is a program that funds projects. And then we recently got additional funding from Google. And so the Google part of this is funding um, our work to map using artificial intelligence and satellite data to map these changes that we're seeing across the landscape. And so um, changes that look very big when you're on the ground, but because the Arctic is so humongous, that's kind of like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And so being able to use satellite data and combining all of this technology will give us like the, the first time opportunity really to map the changes 
across the entire Arctic. And then we will take that information and think about how do we how do we make this usable for people? Like how do you get this kind of complex science and put it in a way that people can actually use it? So that's kind of the, the focus of that. I wanted to um, tell everyone that there are flyers on their seats and what is in that that they should take a look at, what, what informs them about um, Oh, that was not a I that was not a trick question. Um, I just curious. Let's look. Okay, I want everyone sorry. to sort of understand what they're sorry, looking at. <laughs> okay, so okay. Oh yeah, sorry. So here we go. So this is um so this is a a summary of this project from Across Pathways. This was a project that was funded by through TED Audacious, and this is work that we're doing um, with our partners, um, policy experts. Um, climate justice experts, indigenous knowledge holders, scientists, um, to, a, to understand and address local to global impacts of permafrost thaw. So this is describing that project and uh, probably a link to our website. And if you wanna get our, get our newsletter, you can find out information there. Um, and then this one here has, has our bios on the inside. And then on the back, there's QR codes. And I um, do not have my glasses, but there's the, there's the TED Talk, there's a New York Times, a couple of New York Times article, there's a podcast, there's our website. So you can put your phone over all of these and find out more information about the work that we're doing. Yeah. So things to take home and discuss over dinner. Um, are we done with questions? I will close it out and um, give you the opportunity to speak to Sue in person. And thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure to see you all. It's been an absolute honor to talk to Sue. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I uh, just wanted to do a quick heads up for our next Geshki lectures. We have uh, Stephen Schwartzman on August 17th. We have Michael Torres on August 23rd, and we have Dr. Aruni Bhatnagar on August 24th. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening and thank you so much for coming out. Oh, cool. Being talked about, I don't know.